Acts chapter 7, I want to read from verse 51. And I'm going to kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, try to summarize Stephen's whole message tonight. But in Acts chapter 7, I'm just going to read the end of this chapter with you as Stephen gets to the end of his message in verse 51, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? What a question. Think of that. Which of the prophets have your fathers not persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels, that's by the mediation of angels, and have not kept it. Now remember, they were accusing Stephen of blaspheming Moses, but Moses says, you're the ones who are not keeping the law of Moses. And we'll see why. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice. They stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen. Here's his last words, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. What a beautiful prayer in the name. And he directed that prayer to Jesus. I, be, I, I don't know if there's any other, there are a few other examples in the new testament not met very many you know the the general pattern of prayer is we pray in the name of jesus to the father through the holy spirit but here is a prayer directed straight to jesus christ and showing his deity and let's read verse 60 together and he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice lord lay not the sin to their charge and when he had said this he fell asleep okay let's pray Lord, thank you for your precious word. Thank you that your word is truth. Thank you, God, for the wonderful salvation that we have in Christ, that we can know we can face death and look to you in prayer, even in that last moment, and know that you are standing, waiting to receive us as you did receive Stephen when he breathed his last and when he gave up the spirit, Lord. We know that his body fell limp to the earth, but his spirit rose triumphant into your presence. We thank you, Lord, and we pray now you bless this evening and our time in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so I've entitled this message tonight, Why, Why Do Men Reject God? And we're going to see in summary from Stephen's sermon why men do reject God because men's hearts really don't change. Now, the book of Acts, of course, has so many firsts. It has the first filling of the church with the Holy Spirit. It has the first persecution against the church. It has the first lies spoken by seeming members of the church, Ananias and Sapphira, and their hypocrisy. And then there was the first dissension of the church. Last week, we considered that. There was dissension in the church. And then the first deacons were chosen, Acts chapter 6. And here tonight, we see the first martyr of the early church, the first martyr in local church history. And here we see his story, God's story. If you can climb high enough and get a clear vision and you look down, you will see that history is his story. And look, please, as we begin in Acts chapter uh, 7 at verse number 2. Because here we see this great man, Stephen, seeing history. As Stephen's face shines, it says at the end of chapter 6, like the face of an angel. He so speaks the word of God. 
and he is speaking to the Sanhedrin. Understand that. He is speaking to the Jewish rulers and leaders that just in chapter five, remember, they wanted to kill all the apostles. Gamaliel talked them out of it. This is the Sanhedrin, the same group before whom Jesus Christ himself stood in trial and was condemned by them. What courage this takes for Stephen as he stands before the Sanhedrin, revealing the story of what? Verse 2, the glory of God, the God of glory. He says, men and brethren, fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. What a statement of summary of history. The God of glory. It's his story. So this message begins with Stephen saying the God of glory appeared and his message ends with him seeing the glory of God appearing. <laughs> the same glory that appeared to Abraham appears to Stephen as he's about to die. And so thank God that we serve a God of glory who appears and then Stephen saw the glory of God and Jesus standing. As I looked at this whole sermon, the theme of this sermon is how man misses the mark. Misses the mark of the main point of, of all history, the glory of God. Man misses the mark of living for the main purpose of life, which is to live for the glory of God. And so Stephen shows them that they have resisted the God of glory and have missed living for the glory of God. And verse 51 really is our text and summarizes for me the whole message. The verse that I read where Stephen says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart. Stiff-necked is you stubborn, headstrong, rebellious, worldly, unwilling to listen people. <laughs> Stiff neck, uncircumcised in heart, that they were treasonous to God. They were worldly in their hearts. And then he says, you do always resist. Resist means to strive against, to oppose. You always resist the Holy Spirit. You oppose the Holy Spirit. Wow. These are the religious people of the day. Resisting the Spirit of God. Stiff-necked, stubborn, headstrong, worldly, unwilling to listen. And again, remember back in chapter 6, if you look there in Acts 6, the charge against Stephen as he is brought to the Sanhedrin is... Verse 11 of Acts 6, it says, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So this sermon is Stephen's defense. And he's saying, you are the ones who are stiff-necked and who are in fact rebelling and blaspheming against Moses and against God. You do always resist. He is throwing it right. He is not apologizing in any shape sense of the word right he's not backing down he's not saying well you know what you have a point here <laughs> he's saying you are the ones who should be on trial before the god of glory and so they turned against him so in this message what stephen really does is he uses a number of examples from Jewish history, but I'm going to focus especially on two clear types, which the Jewish people were guilty of, of rejecting these two great men of Jewish history, and they will be Joseph and then Moses. They were rejected by the Jewish people of their day, just as the Jewish people of Stephen's day have rejected Jesus Christ. And what makes this also significant to me is how Joseph and Moses are two very powerful types of Jesus Christ. I mean, the parallels between Joseph and Moses and Jesus Christ 
are, are very striking. So we'll try to delve into that just a little. So let's look at this and why men reject God. Well, so the answer to this and why they do it is going to be seen in why they rejected Joseph. Why did they reject Moses? It's the, and, it's, and they rejected Jesus for the very same reason. So that's kind of where I'm going with the study tonight. So if you could stick with me, we'll read some of the verses. So look in Acts chapter 7 as Stephen gets into the message. And he's giving the history of the nation. And then he brings in Joseph. And in Acts chapter 7 and verse 8, it says he gave and he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so and talking of Abraham. And so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day. And Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob begat the 12 patriarchs. And the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all his affliction and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. So the point I just simply want to make here is Stephen is saying Joseph was rejected by his brethren because of envy. And that envy speaks of a boiling anger and hatred. You know, when you have envy, you're really you're really demonstrating hate. Envy is a, is, a, is a way that people hate others. And there's like a boiling jealousy of anger and hatred that spilled over. And it says the patriarchs move with envy. They rejected Joseph and sold him into Egypt. Now, Joseph is an amazing type of Jesus Christ. And for those of you who've been listening to our radio program, you know, because we made a lot about that of the type of Christ that Joseph is that he was the beloved son of his father Jesus is the beloved son this is my beloved son he was hated and rejected when he told of his future exaltation Jesus Christ told of his future exaltation as well that he would be crucified but then he, he would go into glory he would rise again the third day Joseph of course was stripped of his robe and Jesus Christ was stripped of his robe and beaten and Joseph was sold into into uh, the hands of Gentiles and Jesus Christ was delivered by the Jewish people into the hands of, of the Gentile rulers and Joseph then devised a wise plan to reconcile Israel his father as well as his brothers back to himself and looking even into the future God has a plan to reconcile Israel and still Israel will be saved so Joseph is an incredible type of christ let's look at some of these verses go back to genesis chapter 37 and who could read genesis chapter 37 and verse 8 get you guys to read some verses here genesis chapter 37 and here's the brethren's the brother's hatred who's got genesis uh angelica could you read genesis 37 verse 8 yeah. and then um and then bill could you read verse 11 after that Okay, so they didn't want the thought of Joseph what? What, was, what made them so angry here? Yeah, yeah. You're going to rule over us, you, you little punk, you know? Okay, verse 11. Bill, you have that one? Okay, so there's that word, envy, that Stephen himself uses. He says they envied him, and then they rejected him and sold him of course, into slavery, to Egypt. And the same hatred and envy that the brothers of Joseph had against him, that is what was driving the hatred of the Jewish people of Jesus' day against him. So look at Mark chapter 15 and verse number 10. Mark chapter 15 and verse number 10. And here Pilate even knows the schemes and the deceit of the hearts of the Jewish people that have put Christ on trial. And this is Pilate's thoughts here being revealed to us in God's word. Who's got Mark chapter 15, verse 10? Uh, Raul, could you read that, please? 
for he knew that the chief priests had delivered him to death. Okay, so there it is. Envy. The same envy they had toward Joseph, they had toward Jesus Christ. And so why do men reject God? Because of jealousy and envy and hatred. Don't have envy in your heart. It will lead you to go against God, to, to reject uh, men of God, and to ultimately be angry at God, to reject him out of your life. So that's one reason why men reject God. Another reason is... Moses here as another example, also a fascinating type of Christ. And here, going down in the message, as he continues with his sermon, and he brings up Moses, and he actually has a long section here about Moses in his sermon, going down from verse 20, and basically down through many, many verses beyond that, talking about Moses in verse 20 was exceeding fair nursed up in his father's house three months. And you know the story. He was cast out. Pharaoh's daughter took him up, nursed him for her own son. Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, mighty in word and deed. And when he was a full 40 years old, by the way, Stephen summarizes the life of Moses into three 40-year periods, which is, we commonly do that. We, we, and we do that because of Stephen's clear sermon. So when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren. And that's when he slew the Egyptian. They rejected him down in verse number 25. Look what it says there. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God, by his hand, would deliver them. But what does it say? They understood not. So they didn't understand the purpose of what Moses had been trained to do. Moses was trained to do and to lead them out of Israel. Now, may, maybe Moses got ahead of God's timing. I won't get into all that. But he supposed them to understand that God had raised him up to deliver them, but they understood not. And then, of course, the next day as they were striving together, and then Moses killed one of the Egyptians. And look what it says in verse 27. But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as you did kill the Egyptian yesterday? So they understood not. And because they did not understand, what did they do to Moses? They thrust him away. They thrust him. They rejected Moses. Now, Moses is also a fascinating type of Jesus Christ. How? Well, both Moses and Jesus were born during days of oppression. Of course, when Moses was born, who ruled and oppressed the Israelites? The Egyptians. And then when Jesus was born, who ruled and oppressed the, the Israelites? The Romans. So they were both born during times when Israel was in a form of bondage. Both were providentially delivered as babies. Both Think of both when Jesus and Moses were born, other babies like them were being killed. During Moses, through the abortion process, and of course, the slaughtering of the infants in Bethlehem by Herod. Both, in a sense, were shepherds. Moses was a shepherd. Jesus is the good, great, and chief shepherd. Both spent years in seclusion before coming forth as deliverer, I mean, the life of Jesus is amazing that, what do we know of his first 30 years after his birth? What do we know? Just one incident when he was 12 and brought to the temple. That's it. That's all we know from the Bible. So those are the, the, the silent years of Jesus Christ, but God was preparing him to enter into that public ministry, which began, of course, at his baptism. Moses, of course, spent years in preparation, 40 years in preparation and becoming mighty uh, in, the, in the, all the learning of the Egyptians. And then both of their lives were constantly threatened with death. You know, just think how many times, and of faith, how many times did Jesus almost get killed? 
Now, not that we know the exact number, but remember, yeah, probably millions, huh? Yeah. Well, remember the time they wanted to push him off the cliff when he was in Nazareth? And then a number of times they picked up stones to kill him. Now, how many times did they want to kill Moses? <laughs> probably millions, millions of times, right? So they were both constantly threatened by death. Both interceded for the nation. Both came to deliver the nation. The nation. And both men are called meek. Moses, Moses said, said of himself, he was the meekest of all men. I like that, that he actually wrote it. But, uh, but he wrote it by inspiration. So it wasn't pride. He's the only, only, the only way any man could write that about himself if they're inspired by God to do it. But Jesus said, come unto me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. So the point of these two verses, I'm getting this. They, why do men reject God? They rejected Moses out of not understanding, misunderstanding. And I'm getting that from verse 25. They understood not. And then verse 27, they thrust him away. They didn't understand that Moses had been divinely prepared to deliver them. And so, you know what? I often wonder, the Jewish people in Jesus' day, why didn't they study further about like that he was born in Bethlehem? And, and they knew that the prophet Micah said that for when he was born. Remember, Herod called the Jewish men and they said, go study and see. Oh, yeah, he will be born in Bethlehem. So they knew that. Why didn't they look further into that? Why didn't they look further? Why is there no talk later of, of the, the angels, you know, singing? on the Bethlehem hillside to the shepherds, glory to God in the highest. That's never referenced again. I find that very somewhat interesting, but they, they didn't study through. They didn't, they could have understood by the birth of Christ and his preparation years that he was prepared to deliver them. And he was the Messiah who fulfills the promises, but they didn't take time to understand. And then the Jewish people of Moses' day, not only did they not understand his divine preparation, that he was trained, you know, he was trained, you know, fully, he, he was fully Jewish, but trained in all the learning and might of the Egyptians. But then they didn't understand that Moses' motives were so pure. You know, when he came to deliver them, what did he want out of it? Did he want anything back from them? No. His motives were absolutely pure. He asked for nothing in return. When Jesus Christ healed, whoever did he ask for, ever ask for anything in return? No. His motives were absolutely pure. Both Moses and Jesus were pure in their motives. And notice these two words here in verse 25, how that God by his hand would deliver them that's the word used for salvation of Jesus Christ. So Moses, in a sense, was a deliverer, and Jesus Christ is the ultimate deliverer. And so I, I do believe somehow, as Stephen is giving the sermon, and he's showing them that they rejected Joseph out of envy. And the implication is you have rejected Jesus Christ out of envy. And you rejected Moses because you did not understand that he came to deliver you and you've rejected Jesus Christ that you did not because you did not understand that he's come to be the deliverer. And the word is also used in verse 35. This Moses whom they refused saying, who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel, which appeared to him. So Moses was raised up to be a ruler and a deliverer. And Jesus Christ is the ultimate ruler and deliverer. So what's the point here? Men reject, just as they rejected Moses out of misunderstanding, I'm saying this, men reject Jesus Christ today because they misunderstand him. You know who is the most misunderstood person in all of human history? Jesus Christ. And we could give many examples of that in his earthly life, but people do not understand People do not understand. If they only understood him, his love, his purity, 
his, his, his mercy, his grace. I just want to give one example of how Jesus was misunderstood. Go to John chapter two. And uh, May, could you get this verse? Could you read John chapter two and verse 19? And this is very early in the ministry of Christ. This is right after he turned the water into wine and, and then he cleansed the temple. And in John chapter two and verse 19, uh, why don't you read verse, if, could you read verse 18? Why don't you start at verse 18 and read verse 20 also? But verse 19 is the special verse I want. And then verse 21, all of us together, what does it say? He spake. Okay, so they totally misunderstood the words of Jesus. When he said destroy this temple, what was he talking about? Was he talking about him destroying the temple? Oh, he was talking about them destroying his temple. And then in three days, I will raise it up. Was he talking about how he was going to rebuild the temple in three days? No, he was talking about how he would raise up his body. He will raise up himself. So this is what people misunderstand about Jesus. The number one thing they misunderstand, they don't understand the gospel. This is why we have to preach the gospel. Because people have heard it. One thing people know, Jesus did what for me? Most people, even unsaved people know, Jesus what? He died. Oh, he died for me. They don't understand. And we have to preach the gospel that you're a sinner and you're worthy of death in hell. But Jesus Christ died for you. Jesus Christ is the most misunderstood person in history. And you know, when he was on trial, guess what the number one charge against him was? That he was a domestic terrorist. <laughs> Literally. He said he was going to destroy the temple. He's a terrorist to our own country, to our own temple. And when he was on the cross, what did they say to him? They threw these very, these are the words used against him at his trial, nothing else stuck. But this is what they said. This was probably their number one charge against him, that he was some form of domestic terrorist creating insurrection in the land. And they even threw these words at him on the cross. You that said you were gonna destroy the temple, you better get off that cross and do it because the temple's still standing over there. They mocked him. They didn't understand that the son of man was come to seek and to save that which was lost. You know, if people understood what Jesus has come to do, to die on the cross for their sins, to rise again, to rescue, to deliver, to save, to forgive, they would receive. So people reject out of misunderstanding. The third thing and quickly is, they refused Moses again. Moses got two refusals here. The second time, they refused Moses again, out, and I say out of worldliness, and I put in parentheses idolatry. So as you read through this passage, it's really quite an amazing thing. They refused Moses out of worldliness. And he had done so many th things to them. Look at all that Moses gave them. Look at verse 36. What did Moses do in verse 36? What does it say? And he showed what? What did he show? Yeah, wonders and didn't Jesus do wonders and signs? And even though he did so many, they'd say, do us, do us another one. You know, if you're looking for wonders, signs and wonders, it's like just one more will, will satisfy me. All the ones I've seen already didn't. But the signs and wonders, so Moses is a type of Christ and the signs and wonders, and yet they re rejected him. And especially in, in the 40 years in the wilderness, all the different signs and wonders. Verse number 37, what did Moses tell them? That there would be a prophet who would be raised up, who would be like Moses, he would be human, him shall you hear. Who is that prophet? 
That prophet is Jesus Christ. It's clear. And so Moses told him this. So again, remember the charge against Stephen? He was blaspheming against Moses. Stephen is saying, Moses said that there would be a prophet raised up like him. And we need to hear him. And Stephen is like, I have heard him. You have not. You are the ones who are against Moses. So he's putting it right back at them. What did Moses give them in verse 38? There's a, or actually, no, at the beginning of verse 38, what did Moses lead? I'll put it that way. What does it say that Moses led? He led a church. <laughs> a church where? In the wilderness. You know, and that is the same word we use for church, ecclesia. Now, what Stephen's saying, now we know that that wasn't the New Testament church, but it was a church of a sort, because what does ecclesia mean? It means a called out body, a called out group from. So had they been called out? Where were they called out from? They would be called out of Egypt to be in the wilderness. And so in a sense, Moses had, in that sense, a called out body that he was leading through the wilderness and who has started a church as Stephen is preaching here Jesus Christ and I believe he's making that parallel you rejected Moses who had the called out body in the wilderness and now you've rejected Jesus Christ who's calling out a body to himself and then what does he say that Moses gave them and there's an interesting little phrase and the word is not oysters it's not living oysters it's what oracles that's an interesting word it's used we won't look up this i think it's used four times in the new testament living oracles in my beautiful henry morris study bible that i have here henry morris you know what he says in his study notes he says the living oracles there's three other references to this it speaks of the utterances of god that are vibrantly alive i like that vibrantly it's the vibrant living word of god the statements of god moses gave them living oracles and they rejected moses as it says in verse number then verse 39 says why they thrust him out it says to whom our fathers would not obey but thrust him from them in their hearts and turn back into egypt so that's why they rejected moses even though he had done all that he did signs and wonders. He gave them promises of a Messiah. He led them through the wilderness. He gave them the word of God, but they wanted the gods of their land. That's why people reject the Lord still today. The worldliness of this present, the present world is always very strong. Why are many people rejecting the Bible today? Because it, it goes against the, the way the culture is telling us we have to think. Do, do, do not underestimate the power of this world system over whom the God of this world, Satan, rules. The God of this world, Satan, uses the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life to deceive people to reject the Savior, Jesus Christ. And so they thrust out Moses and they turn back to the golden calf of Egypt and later on to the worldliness. It even says of Malcolm, of, of, of Moloch, I'm sorry, in verse 43, you took up the tabernacle of Moloch. And that's a picture of Moloch. Moloch was basically the Ammonite god of child sacrifice. Moloch was the deity that would require you to give your child to the fire as a sacrifice to Moloch. Moloch was the ancient god of abortion. And it's still a very popular god today that's calling people to follow him and reject the Lord Jesus Christ. So with amazing courage, Stephen stands against this group of people that have rejected Jesus Christ, just as their fathers have rejected Joseph out of envy, as they rejected Moses out of misunderstanding and rejected Moses again out of worldliness. So they have rejected Jesus Christ. And I'll close by saying this. Whenever something bad happens, 
can be really bad. People say, where was God? Where was God when that happened? Well, here's Stephen being stoned. And I'm so thankful for this story in the Bible, this true narrative, because it tells us exactly where God is when the very worst thing in, in time in life is happening to you. So there's Stephen about to be stoned. And where was God? Where was Jesus Christ? It says it right here. Verse 56. I see the heavens open and the son of man standing on the right hand of God. So that's where Jesus Christ is when all the world is caving in on you. He is at the father's right hand and he's praying for us. He's making intercession for us and he's hearing our prayers. And so Stephen could confidently say as, as the stones were piling up around him and taking away his breath, he could say, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He could pray like Jesus prayed upon the cross. And then he could pray and almost say what Jesus said. Remember what Jesus said on the cross, father, forgive them. And he says, Lord, Lay not this sin to their charge. And so as we go to prayer tonight, know this, that Jesus is still at the Father's right hand to hear our prayers. Let's pray.